This is our third session on verses 2 and 3 of this paragraph in Philippians 4, starting here at verse 2. So this unit here. And in this session, I want to step back. Last time I mentioned that he called for this true companion to help these women, Euodia and Syntyche, to help them because they are not agreeing. There's some kind of failure to be of the same mind. We don't know if it's strategic or personnel or uh, theologically significant. We, we don't know what it is, but he calls him to help them. So I'm going to step back and say, how did Paul model for this true companion how to help these women? I think there are at least eight things to see here. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree, have the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, my true companion, to help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Father, if Paul asked this companion to help them, surely he expected this companion to take his cue from what Paul was doing in this letter to help these women. What Would you show us how we can help people who are not of one mind. Maybe we are one of those people who are in some conflict with others. God, help us to learn from the way Paul helped his companion help them. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing I see is that he simply confronted the issue head on. In fact, we might think from our standpoint, it was a little blunt and public, right? I entreat Euodica. Wow. He names her. He names her. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree. Now you might think, wow, is this kind of a public shaming? And my guess is no. I want to give Paul the benefit of the doubt here. Probably this issue was so well known in the church and so public, and they had asked Paul about it, at least all of that is possible, so that when Paul addresses it directly, it's exactly what these women expected him to do and what everybody else expected him to do. How will Paul help us with this uh, problem of those who have been fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life, who have labored side by side in the gospel. These are not, these are not renegade women. These are right at, the, right at the heart of the ministry of this church and with Paul himself. So step number one, direct dealing with an issue. Number two, he couched it in uh, the context of beloved, my joy, my crown, whom I love. These women are included here, even though it says my brothers here, that often stands, as you can see in the margin of the ESV, often stands for everybody in the church, the brothers and the sisters in the church. So he, he sets up his exhortation here with, I love them. They are my joy. They are my crown. They are my beloved They've labored side by side with me, and on and on and on. So, uh, putting them in the context of he, he treasures them. Number three, um, he sends them back with this word. We saw this before with this word, thus. Stand firm thus in the Lord. And this, therefore, they point back. And what do they point back to? These immediately preceding verses, our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The point there is, stand firm 
thus in the Lord. In other words, he's lifting, he's lifting the minds of Euodia and Syntyche and his true companion and all the others. He's lifting their minds to these magnificent realities, citizenship in heaven, a great Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, the transformation of our lowly bodies, his present power to subject all things to himself. You know, so many of our little arguments with children, with husband, with wife, with partners in ministry, with friends, will be swallowed up in bigger things and given their proper perspective if we do what Paul did here and send people back to stand thus in the Lord and make sure that these these disagreements here are kept in proper perspective. That's number three. Number four, I would say, he entreats them rather than commanding them. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Sintika. He repeats the word lest the significance of it be lost. There is a word for command. This is not it. This is come alongside and entreat, woo, beckon, call someone to do something Rather than standing over them, he's coming in alongside them here in order to communicate how, uh, what, what a kinship he feels with them. Fifth, the phrase, in the Lord, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. The point of that is to say, look, ladies, I'm not calling into question that you are with me in the Lord Jesus. We are one in the Lord. And in the Lord, neither male nor female, slave nor free, barbarian, Scythian, which is so deeply, deeply one in the Lord. And you are one with each other in the Lord. In fact, it might be helpful just to look here at Ephesians 4, where Paul says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of of the calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain. And that's the word I wanted you to see. They're not creating the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. They're maintaining it. And so here, when he says to them, he wants them to be uh, healed and wants them to have one mind he, he, he wants them to see that doesn't create your union with the Lord. That doesn't put you into union with each other. You are unified with each other because you're all in the Lord. And so I want you to find a way, Paul says, to work it out. Number six, Paul happily identifies with them. This is so beautiful. He says, yes, I ask you, true companion, help these women, and here it is, who have labored side by side with me. Now, that's amazing. So back when he was at Philippi, these women were new converts, evidently, maybe maybe, uh, like Lydia, because she was one of the converts at Philippi, but they were they were in the thick of gospel ministry, doing evangelism and all kinds of things that Paul reveled in. And he wanted them to remember, you were with me in the gospel. I'm not hesitant. You're not, I'm not saying that you were one of those outliers who wouldn't participate. I'm saying you were right there, arm in arm, laboring side by side with me in the gospel. That's an amazing tribute paid to these women to encourage them to press on to find unity in the Lord. The seventh thing he does is align them with Clement. Now, we don't know anything about Clement in this uh, letter, but the fact that he would name somebody would seem to indicate he wants us to see. Now, everybody knows Clement, He assumes that, otherwise he'd say something about him. And Clement is one of the outstanding people that everybody knows. And they were laboring with me and with Clement. They were like Clement in the gospel. So an alignment with a well-known person, not 
somehow excluded or isolated in their problem character. They're not. And then he says that the rest of his fellow workers, they were part of that, whose names are in the book of life. And that's what we're going to look at next time. What, why did he mention this? What does it signify? It's like saying they're in the Lord, their names are in the book of life. This is, these are two enormously important statements about these women to encourage them that they're standing in the Lord, they're standing in the book of life, is not being questioned by Paul. Within that context, he is summoning them to unity. So next time we'll take up, how does this work? What is it? What's being said about them here that would help them make progress?